shouting at the people the whole time. And so this is uh, wonderful, and it's great to be here at Westside. I appreciate so much the elders of this congregation uh, for the invitation, and for Steve uh, relinquishing the pulpit for a night. I appreciate uh, that very much. And I bring you uh, greetings and, and love from a little town in West Tennessee called Henderson, where uh, Frida Hardeman is located, and we're in our 150th year there at uh, Frida Hardeman. I've been teaching there for 14 years. Um, I was in behavioral sciences, actually in the clinical mental health counseling program for 13 years, and they finally kicked me out over to the Bible department. So, but uh, it's wonderful to, to be over there and uh, helping to pre prepare ministers and um, others for, for works of service in God's church. Sometimes um, when I'm speaking, I, I forget to articulate this, and I, I would like to say this. I know in a, a group of this size, on an evening such as this, in a, a congregation of God's people, that there are always those individuals that are, are sitting under the sound of, of a preacher's voice that are struggling, that are suffering. And sometimes that, that suffering or that struggle may be visible externally. It may be a physical malady that you're dealing with, or it may be invisible. It may be something related to mental health, to depression or anxiety or addiction, uh, relationship issues. I am so glad that you chose to be here tonight. And I, I really hope that the message this evening is a message of hope and a message of light and one that uh, gives you maybe some meaning in the midst of, of suffering. As I think about men and women of God over the centuries that have been faithful, yet who have suffered um, emotionally particularly, I think of people like Abraham and, and Sarah. I think of Moses. I think of men like Elijah, who at one point was suicidal in his ministry. I think of women like Hannah who were childless. I think of the Apostle Paul who struggled with his anxiety over the churches and, and over the persecutions that he uh, dealt with. And I think about a man by the name of David. In 1 Samuel 13 and verse 14, we're told that David was a man after God's own heart. And David was a man who suffered as well emotionally. I'm not sure where to point this, but I'm going to just do this and maybe we can change the screen or not. There we go. David at points uh, felt very close to God, but there are points in, in David's life that, that he felt as if God was maybe a million miles away. He knew intellectually that God was not, but emotionally there was that, that sense of, of distance. And I think, for example, of this text that we have from Psalm uh, 31, and I invite you to open your Bible to the 31st Psalm. As in verse 9 and 10, David cries out to his God, and he says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Then in verse 12 he says, I have become forgotten, or I have been forgotten, like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. David was not in a good place in his life when he spoke those words. And, of course, we know some of the issues surrounding his uh, sin with Bathsheba and uh, Uriah's uh, death and some of those types of issues. But there are some times in David's life that he was innocent and he was being chased down by a megalomaniac called Saul, a, a, a king. And uh, David feared for his life and was on the run and oftentimes was wondering where God was in, in the midst of all of this. In Psalm 42, there's another psalmist, and this time it's not David, but it's one of the sons of Korah. 
Typically, when we take a look at, at Psalm 42, and I invite you to turn there, because I'd like to actually read the first couple of verses. These are the verses we really like to quote and sing about, but we don't typically go further down into verse 3 and following. Verse 1 and 2 says, As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, where when shall I come and appear before God? And so we, we love that song and we sing, As the deer pants for the water. It's a beautiful song and it's meaningful. But we often miss the context of this psalm. It's really a, a psalm of, of lament and, and there's struggle in this psalm for this particular individual because it goes on in verse 3 and 4 where he says, My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me continually, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with sh glad shouts and songs of praise and multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise his name, my salvation and my God. I see four movements in those first few verses. In the first couple of verses, we see the sense of a longing for God, a, a, a thirsting for God. And then in the next verse, verse 3, we see this process of weeping and, and the sorrow. And then in the next verse, verse 4, we see a remembering, looking back to a more joyful time in, in his life. And then in verse 5, we see both questioning mixed with hoping in God whom he wonders as to God's presence and God's being there for him, though he knows that God is his salvation. I don't know about you tonight, but I know firsthand, and I, I think you would concur with me, that sometimes life can be hard. Amen? Amen? In fact, life can be very, very hard at times. I'm going to share some difficult stories tonight from uh, mine and my wife's life about some difficult times, and maybe you will be able to relate to those. But you know, we live in a culture that so often promotes a health and wealth gospel. If you're a Christian, then, man, everything's going to go great, and you're going to live in this, this victory, but the, the victory is defined in a certain way. Basically, that life's going to be a rose garden. Jesus nowhere promised that life would be a rose garden. In fact, Jesus did make a promise, but it's the exact opposite of that. In John 16, when he said, In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And so... In light of that, as believers, there are times... Next slide. I'll go on beyond that. There are times that we feel like we are lost in a labyrinth or lost in an emotional maze. This particular picture comes from Cincinnati and the Riverwalk. And I was visiting there several months ago. I saw children playing in this labyrinth, and they were having a great time because they were able to jump over the hedges, Right? They weren't necessarily following the path out. And I got to watch this, and I was amused by, and, and I experienced joy seeing the kids having fun. But then I, I realized that there are many people that are in an emotional and spiritual labyrinth. They don't know how exactly they got to the place that they are, but they feel stuck, they feel lost, they feel confused, they feel exhausted, and they realize that there's no exit sign anywhere. And every turn that they seem to make seems to be a, a dead end or a false turn and a, a decoy. And they feel like they will be stuck in this maze for the rest of their life, emotionally and spiritually. A lot of people that I visit with in my counseling practice are in that spot. And it hurts and it's painful to them. And depression itself hurts deeply. 
If you've never battled with clinical depression or anxiety, I, I would be pretty sure that you've battled with bouts of the blue at times. Maybe not of the clinical level, but at least these, these dark days, these down days, these difficult days, that it's just a little bit more tough to get going and, and you feel maybe downcast in your spirit as the psalmist did. Brothers and sisters, we're dealing with a blue epidemic in our country. The blue epidemic is the epidemic of depression, and it's astounding that the statistics over the last five or six years, and of course I work on a university campus, I know that those that are here that are associated with different universities in this town see so many college students that, that are struggling. And I, I'm glad that the church and our Christian universities are waking up to this and realizing, hey, our, our kids need, they need more than just a pat on the back and a little pep talk. Uh, there, there's a need for deeper help than that because of some of the, the backgrounds and the situations that they are addressing. But 18 million adults in the U.S. in any given year are diagnosed with depression. On a global scale, over 350 million people of all ages suffer with clinical depression. Women, about 10% of all women in the U.S., have some sort of depression diagnosis. Did you know that? About 5% of men. So twice as many women as men. You know why that is? Because the women have to live with men. That is why that is. And there might be more truth to that than I am letting on. But we know that there are these, these struggles in our adult population. As far as disability issues go, between the age of 15 and 44, depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. And diagnoses are growing the fastest for millennials and really beyond millennials, Generation Z. But for millennials, those under the age of 35, the diagnoses have increased from 47% since 2013. Next, among youth, the rate for our young people aged 12 through 17, this is startling to me, but depression rates have risen 63% since 2013. I'm often asked, why is that, Ryan? What do you think's going on? And I don't have a, just a, a clear answer. I, I, I would say one thing, that probably the statistics are somewhat skewed. Um, one of the reasons through social media, for example, our young people are more apt to be more forthcoming about some of these issues, and sometimes it may be a little bit almost in vogue to have some sort of, of issue, but it's still serious. I see four parts to this, and I don't have a slide for this, but just visualize this in, in your mind, maybe four orbs, all right? And in the one is the word fragmentation. Our young people, our millennials as well, deal with a lot of fragmentation, broken homes, uh, being pulled in, in so many different directions all at the, the same time by, by the world. And, and by the, the temptations and the struggles in, in this world. And so that fragmentation, and then the second orb, I call it saturation. Because our, our kids are saturated by so many messages through the media, through social media. Some of the messages are, you are less than, you are no good. Unless you act in a certain way or do certain things, you have no worth or value. Saturated with those types of messages, the messages of bullying often, we see just a rise in our, our young people's anxiety and, and depression. Saturation. The third area has to do with expectation. So many of our kids are operating under unrealistic expectations of what life is supposed to be like but also, t at times, realistic expectation. With all the school shootings and all the issues around, there's just a, a pervasive sense of anxiety and, and a downness among our kids. And they, they deal with things that it's hard for me to really grasp the, the extent of, 
of the emotional duress that many of them are under. But that expectation, whether it's a unrealistic or a realistic expectation, they're between a, a rock and a hard place. Then the final orb, I call it isolation. Because though they're hyper-connected through social media, and whether it's Twitter or um, Snapchat or Facebook or whatever it is, Instagram, a lot of our kids still feel very much alone. They feel very much isolated from others in their relationships. So those four things are, are a part and parcel of the culture and the society in which we, we live. And just about nothing hurts a, a parent or a, a grandparent more than to see their child or their grandchild suffer. I'm a parent. I've got a, a daughter that's 21 and is married and a great son-in-law and then a son who's 19. When my kids suffer, I suffer. <laughs> when they hurt, I hurt. I would gladly take their pain upon myself if I could. And I know in congregations where I, I speak, there there's so many families that are, are really struggling and, and issues that have happened over the last few years with suicide and, and other um, struggles in the congregation with children and grandchildren. And our hearts break, and my heart goes out to you if you have dealt with that in your own family. Speaking of suicide, it's the third leading cause of death in adolescence and the second leading cause of death among college-age youth. Depression is the primary reason why someone dies of suicide every 13 minutes, about 41,000 per year. Brothers and sisters, isn't it time we kind of woke up and realized that, that we're, we're at war? with the evil one. We, we're in war in this world, and this is a tough place to live. Depression, though, is a medical condition. It's a disease or a mood disorder because of a lack of serotonin, one of the neurotransmitters. And sometimes people feel weak because they don't know how to address it, and they, they don't want to take antidepressants, which maybe they need to be taking to offset some of these issues. But some of the symptoms are often ignored or minimized, and I just want to encourage us as brothers and sisters never to minimize or downplay some of these issues, because it could be a matter of life and death, and we need to be a caring community. That's my wife and I, Missy. Glad is with me. She's to be out at the table um, after services. I've battled with bouts of the blues in my life. And my main issue, and I'll just be transparent, I, I deal more with anxiety, and there are times that I really deal with anxiety. Missy deals more with clinical depression. And there's some reasons behind that. I'd like to tell you a little bit about that so you can connect to it. She's been very brave to let me share some of these things, and, and she said to me, Several months ago, when we were finishing up the, the book, she said, Ryan, if just one person's life is, is saved as a result of, of this, it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. Back when we were in college and we were young and in love and very broke, uh, we're still broke, but just at a different level, all right? But uh, Missy uh, was very outgoing and, and gregarious and extroverted at that time, and I, I was really drawn to that, and she still has a light about her. But just uh, within the first year or so of our marriage, she started having issues, um, pain in her lower back, and long story short, it was discovered she had an incurable kidney disease. She was just 20 years old. And so we were told at that time that it wouldn't be that many years before she would go into kidney failure. Well, she outdid the odds, and her kidney did pretty well for quite a while with good diet and, and other um, uh, medicines and such like. But eventually, her kidney started, kidneys started going downhill. And at the time, we were in ministry in North Texas. 
uh, near Wichita Falls, a little town called Henrietta, Texas. I remember giving Missy shots at least once or twice a month. The shots cost $1,500 out of pocket, out of pocket. Remember, I was on a preacher salary, all right? And we were going through that situation and trying to deal with her anemia and then all these things related to her kidney. And about that time, I'm going to suspend that story for a moment, and I'll come back to it in a second. About that time, uh, when our son Austin was four years old, and he's 19 now, he's four years old, and Missy had taken the, the kids up to Kansas to go visit her family. She's from southeast Kansas. And had come back, and Austin had all these little fingerprint bruises all over his body. And we couldn't figure out what the issue was. We knew that Grandpa had been tickling him very innocently, and Missy had seen that, and couldn't explain why he would have these fingerprint bruises. And we were thinking, well, maybe it's some sort of iron deficiency or some issue like that. And so, first day of VBS, and it was in June, um, we decided to have Missy take Austin by his pediatrician, and then the pediatrician said, look, take him on to VBS, bring him back, and after VBS, we'll do some blood work. And so we, we did that. And um, did the blood work, and it's no fun doing blood work for a four-year-old, right? But I went back to my office, and about an hour later, my phone rang. And on the phone, it was Missy. And I couldn't really make out what she was saying because she was crying on the phone, kind of babbling on the phone. I could make out two words, and the one word was Austin, and the other word was leukemia. So I got out of there as soon as I could, jumped in my truck, and peeled out of that gravel parking lot, and as I was driving over the railroad tracks out to our house, I remember just hyperventilating as I just couldn't breathe, knowing, not knowing really what this meant. I got home, I rushed in the, the parsonage, and Missy was curled up on the recliner in the fetal position, just wet with tears, and she said that the doctor had called and something about his white blood count and she couldn't make it all out. And about that time, the phone rang and it's Dr. Parkey. He says, Ryan, you need to get Austin to Cook Children's Hospital immediately. They're waiting on you right now because his white blood count's 169,000. Supposed to be between 5 and 12,000. So we pack up and Austin doesn't know what's going on. He's, you know, he's just a four-year-old kid and so we get him in the car and sister in the vehicle, and we head to Fort Worth, and we arrive there, and they, they do blood work immediately again. This time, his blood work, it's 215,000. They said, unless we start chemo right now, his organs are going to start shutting down. So what do you do as a parent? You do whatever you've got to do, right? So we, we start with that, and by the way, for the next three and a half years, we did chemo. One more year in Texas, two and a half years after we moved to Tennessee. Well, in the second year of his chemo, Missy's kidneys, back to Missy, really start failing. They're down to 17% function. At Vanderbilt, the doctors say, look, you've got to, it's, it's either have a kidney transplant or uh, she's going to have to go on dialysis and we'd rather do the transplant before dialysis. And so we go through this, this whole issue. I think I'm a match and then I turn out that I'm not a match and finally the one of the ministers at College Church, so Stephen Yakeley, she's got his kidney in, him, in her. But when we were at Vanderbilt, going through that kidney transplant, that same, the same day our son Austin was getting chemotherapy at St. Jude. Same day, my brother took him down for, for chemo. On the door of Missy's hospital room, she had made this poster, and the poster simply said, I am weak but he is strong. She wasn't talking about this fella, because this fella was a basket case. You know, I used to believe up to that point in my life that God never gives us more than we can handle. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. What the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to bear, but with every temptation will provide a way of escape. But as far as being able to handle it, when I found myself on the ground, lying prost prostrate on the ground, my arms out, crying out to God, saying, God, I can't 
handle this. I can't handle all of this. I know Missy can't handle all of this. We realize that our God can handle this because we couldn't handle it. And we have to trust in the Lord and trust in the Lord's people and the church was incredible for stepping in and helping and transporting our kids and taking care of our meals and, and all these things that we just couldn't, we just couldn't physically do. Fast forward a few months, Missy's diagnosed with cancer herself, endometrial cancer. So she's just getting smacked down over and over and over. One day we went to Vanderbilt for her checkup and I could notice Missy's emotions were very flat. She had confided in me, she said, Ryan, there are times that when I'm driving in the car with the kids, I'll buckle them into their car seats, but I don't buckle my seatbelt on purpose. She didn't, she wasn't actively suicidal, but she wanted to go on to be with the Lord. She just couldn't deal with everything going on. And I wasn't sure what to help. And what's, that's tough because I'm a therapist. I should know what to do. Right? And she went in to see a nephrologist, and a nephrologist, she told the nephrologist, I, I don't know what's going on. She said, I, my husband loves me. My kids adore me. I've got a, got a good education, a good job. But I just can't get up. I, I can't get moving. My, I ache all over. I, I just feel so down and low and, and depressed. And the kidney doctor said, look, that's welcome to good company. A lot of people that have transplants deal with that. And Missy, because of all these other episodes, plus coming by it honestly, her mother had suffered with depression, so there was a genetic component in there, plus all these triggers. And the doctor was great and so helpful. So Missy and I came up with kind of a color code to help me know what she was going through, what sort of day she was having. We call it shades of blue, sunshine yellow, which is a great day, sky blue, a manageable day, violet blue, a hard day, and dark indigo, an impossible day. So I would like to walk through these with you quickly. Number one, sunshine yellow is a great day. You feel like you can keep up, and she feels like she can keep up with daily responsibilities and still have room to smile and even take on creative tasks. Grateful to God to, to be alive and to see things more clearly. And Psalm 118, 24 fits that type of day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. That's a sunshine yellow day. Can you relate? Good day. Next day is a sky blue day. It's a manageable day, though she senses, maybe though you sense the presence of depression and the blues there lurking in the shadows, you're still able to get your work done and take care of your responsibilities, take care of the chores for your family, friends, or if you're a student, for your schoolwork. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. But then there's a violet blue day. Violet blue is a hard day. Everything is getting darker. You have trouble doing what needs to get done for yourself and others. And maybe you're sad, but you don't know why. Sometimes it's hard to breathe. It's, it's hard to, to get moving. Your body aches and you have difficulty accomplishing the day's tasks. But that's what you're experiencing. Isaiah 41.10 is the verse for you. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Ah, but then there's dark indigo. Dark indigo is the darkest shade of blue before everything goes to black. That's a day that we feel like God is a million miles away. That's a day when we feel like David did in Psalm 22 when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me. The same psalm that Jesus tapped into that human experience when Jesus is on the cross. By the way, I think Jesus was citing the whole psalm. The whole 22nd psalm, which actually ends with faith and, and courage and trust in the Lord. But it sure starts out with the psychological duress that David was under and that Jesus was under. 
It's an impossible feeling day. Life is extremely difficult. Everything hurts. Your, your mind, your body, your relationships, your spirit. Simple tasks seem insurmountable. Getting up in the morning, putting on your clothes, taking a shower, brushing your teeth, feeding your pet, getting in the car, driving to work. You know, Psalm 34, verse 8 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Amen. It may not feel like God is there, but God is there. It may not feel like God loves me right now, but God does love me right now. It may not feel like there's a way out, but there is a way that God can and will sustain you. But believers often feel guilty for their depression. They assume, if only I had more faith, I wouldn't feel this way. If only I was a better mother or a better father or a better child, better student. If only I read the Bible more or prayed more, I wouldn't be dealing with this. Well, unfortunately, you might still be dealing with it because this is neurochemical. We often feel pretty good about helping others, but we are very good at beating ourselves up when we feel useless and unworthy of joy and complete, like complete spiritual failures. Others of us might feel like we're drowning in a sea of despair. Finding the strength to cope may seem just impossible. You know those different shades of blue I spoke about? That dark indigo, it does cycle. You've got to hang in there. Don't give up. When you're at the end of your rope, you tie a knot in the end of the rope and you just hold on. You hold on for dear life until better days come. It's important to recognize that depression is not a symptom of faithlessness. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that thorn in the flesh was, whether it was his eye uh, his vision situation or uh, uh, things resulting from being stoned or the, the, the abuse and the, the um, persecution that he dealt with at the hands of others or sin or some type of depression or anxiety. We don't know what it was. But all we know is he asked God three times to take it away. And God every time said no. God said no. But God did say to him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul responds in verse 10 where he says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, Missy often feels weak, but she's strong. She's a school counselor. And those little kids at her school, they think she is awesome. And you can't fool little kids very long because she sees them. Because of her own struggle, she's able to sense their pain. She's able to tap into their fear and their sadness and the faculty in her school. She's able to see that. When we go traveling around, or rather just in the Jackson area, when we're in Walmart, and little kids see her, they call her Miss Missy, which is very Tennessee, all right? But Miss Missy. And they run up to her, and I might be standing there, and I'm like, hey, what about me? My chopped liver? They don't care about me. She's a rock star, and I'm a groupie. I'm nothing. But they see, they see her love. I've had so many elders and, and leaders in the Lord's Church and missionaries share with me over the years that they wanted to quit their ministry because they were dealing with depression. And they felt like they just couldn't keep on going on. And I, I said, no, you, you don't need to quit because there are people in the congregation or in your community that only you can connect with because of your pain. Because of your weakness, you have that sensitivity, that radar. You've got that insider knowledge. 
We need to get you the, the care you need, but you can help in ways that no one else can. In Proverbs 17, 22, it says, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit drives up the bones. Very quickly, there are three strategies I want to share with you. I call them my three R's. The first R is to recognize God's abiding presence. God is still there. It may not feel like it, but God is there. God sees you. He knows you. He loves you. He's never going to love you more than He loves you right now. And He's never going to love you less than He loves you right now. He loves you. He's there. Hebrews 13, 5, Jesus says, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Recognize God's presence. Number two, reach out to others. By reaching out to others in service, you're able to take your eyes off yourself and find meaning in your pain. Not, not in spite of your depression or anxiety, but precisely because of it, that you're able to serve through that. Reach out to others. Number three, respect your limitations. You do have limitations with your energy and your strength and your emotional wherewithal. Know when to say no, but also know when to say yes and to serve. Depression can be a doorway to greater depth and discovery. 2 Corinthians 1. We can get that quickly. 2 Corinthians 1. Let me go beyond that. There we go. Verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. This is awesome. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In Paul's way of thinking, we reach out because our suffering produces an increased sensitivity to the needs of others. We've got to shift our perspective. We need to open up our eyes. We need to be like the Lord who looked out and was moved with compassion for those that were like sheep without a shepherd. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves, which implies self-love. It implies other love. In Psalm 30 and verse 5, David wrote this. He said, Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. What a beautiful psalm infused with, with hope and with joy. You know, when I think about serving selflessly, I think about this next verse, if we can put, pull it up, please. Matthew 20, 28, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'm going to ask you to stand up with me for a moment. I'm going to pull up the next slide. Stand up with me. And I don't want you to take this in the wrong way at all. I'm not going Pentecostal on you. I do teach at Frieda Hardeman. Keep that in mind, all right? <laughs> so I'm conservative. But if you put your hands up like this, you do that with me, please. This position of, of, it's really a position of victory, but it's also a position of openness to God and receptivity to, to God. It's really hard to feel down or low when we're doing this, right? We're opening up and we're saying to the Lord, look, I want to live as a victor, not as a victim. I want to be more than a conqueror, as Romans 8 says. The devil wants you to live with a victim mentality. But Jesus came so that you might live to the full and have the abundant life. Now, you're going to keep your arms up like this until Wednesday night, and Steve, you can tell them then to take it down. You can take your arms down, but stay standing with me. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So, last slide. Never give up. Never give up. Take hold of God's loving hand. Don't let go. He will never let go of you. He will never let go of you. Find meaning. 
Find meaning in your pain. Find, a, find purpose in your suffering. And realize that when we suffer, oftentimes we're walking in the steps of the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. He wasn't immune from suffering. It's been such a pleasure to be here tonight. There might be someone that's subject to Christ's invitation. If you need to come repenting of sin, confessing belief in Jesus and being immersed in the waters of baptism to have your sins removed, or tonight if you need to come back into a faithful relationship with the Lord, or this evening if you just need prayers for encouragement and you're going through a tough time, I know the elders of this church, the ministers of this church would be happy to listen and let you talk and not be judgmental because they are here to, to help and love on you tonight. Why don't you come? Let's together we stand and as we sing.